hab ich doch die ganze Woche mein feines Liebchen nicht gesehen. Sean, Sean, ich Sean, Sean wrong stage, sorry. <lacht> sorry, okay. Good point, good point. Thank you. Ahoy. Ahoy. Do you know that character? Kur uh, Kurtak? Kurtak. Kurtak, that's yes. it. Okay. It's a famous uh, character like in a TV show for children and also in Germany. I really love that character. <laughs> so I'm Johannes. Uh, I founded a company called Pyrigon. We are based in Augsburg. That's in Germany. And my name is Sean Larkin. I work at Microsoft on Microsoft Edge. Uh, but you may know us as two maintainers who maintain an open source project called Webpack. Who here actually uses Webpack with a raise of hands? So everyone. <laughs> okay, cool. Just making sure. Double checking. So today we're going to talk about oh. <laughs> secret tips to improve your Webpack config. So this isn't the average uh, deep dive on how Webpack works under the hood or the things you, know, you need to know to make your own plugins. This is even more secret. These tips to make your Webpack config perfect. So tip number one, did you know that you don't even need a Webpack config to get started? It's true. So all of the configuration you see here is actually what Webpack does by default. The entry property, output, what we resolve, how much, like what the file name is, where the destination is going to be. All of this we built in under the hood, starting with Webpack 4 and up. And the goal was that you should be able to start using Webpack for the first time without ever having to worry about configuring anything. Who are we to decide, you know, who are we to decide whether or not, you know, you should get started because the barrier entry is too high. So. And although there are some things that we recommend you do configure or set, like production and development mode, you can still actually do these things through command line uh, flags. You can use your development mode, production, or none, but we don't recommend that. <laughs> very, very specific scenarios. So. But all these can be flags. And you just have to run Webpack with a, with a specified mode, or you can add it to the config. OK. Write that one down. <laughs> so our next tip is that uh, you can actually use TypeScript in your Webpack config. And uh, this is a feature a lot of people don't know. And I'm really happy to show it to you. So if you want to use TypeScript in your Webpack config, the first thing is you do is that you rename your webpack config.js to webpack config ts then you of course install the types and you also need to install ts node which is uh, necessary to execute typescript with node and then you create a variable using the webpack.configuration type and it looks like this and the, the, uh, what you also need to do, uh, since we're using ECMAScript modules, you also need to add the ES module interop uh, flag, but you probably already have that. All, almost all TypeScript configs I've seen have this flag yep. on. It should probably be default. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll talk to the team. Do you know anybody at Microsoft? Well, no. Okay, well, <laughs> we'll find out. Brian, do you hear that? Okay. <laughs> And the cool thing is that you get IntelliSense, so uh, you don't need to guess the configurations anymore. Uh, your editor will show it to you. So you're saying it'll validate your config before you even run your build? Yes. There's a mistake. Output path is not an array. It should be a string, and TypeScript will tell you that. So I never have to remember any of it? Just rely on the types? Yeah. OK. So how does it work? It's actually a Webpack CLI feature, so it doesn't work if you use the Node Webpack API. And uh, Webpack CLI uses a module, it's called Interpret, um, which maintains a dictionary of file extensions and associated module loaders. So that's why it's searching for TS Node in your Node modules. And this is also the reason that why you can also use Babel to transpile your Webpack config. 
Uh, so if you rename your Webpack config to Webpack config dot Babel dot JS, and you also make sure that uh, a Babel config is in your project directory, it will also compile your Webpack config. So you're saying you could do it with CoffeeScript also? Yeah, you can if you want to. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, good point. Just curious. <laughs> don't do that, please. <laughs> okay, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> so the next tip, did you know that Instead of just an object, Webpack can, you can return a function that returns an object. But why, why do we care about this so much? Show, let's, let's see what it looks like. So instead of just exporting an object with a bunch of types or properties, uh, you're instead going to have a function that returns an object. And this is super, super important. I think that every Webpack configuration should uh, use this feature. Um, who has different development environments? <laughs> Like everybody, you have a production mode in development, right? Of course you do. And we even try to enforce it with Webpack. So why is this so useful is because it allows you to pass in different environment variables from the command line that you can actually use inside your configuration as variables themselves. So take, uh, when you actually pass these flags in using dash dash emv, you'll see uh, the argument that is in the function that returns the config actually now has these properties available. Now, if, you, if you're going to use this or have multiple types or different, um, different types that are going to be assigned to, to these flags, we recommend that you default it to an empty object just so that your config doesn't throw. But you can see here, we can pull flags like mode or debug, like we saw in the example before, and then we just assign them to configuration values. <clears throat> and we also recommend to always use default values so that the configuration always works if you don't provide any of these configuration flags. Exactly. And this feature is called environment options. So the next tip is the multi-compiler mode. Oh, that sounds fancy. That sounds really crazy. Whoa. But in okay. fact, it's really easy to, to um, turn on the multi-compiler mode. All you need to do is to return an array of configurations. And this is really, really useful if you're building an isomorphic JavaScript app where you need to transpile your bundle for the browser and also for Node. In this example, you see we have different targets. One is web and one is node. And you can also name the different compilations, and it will show in the output um, different child uh, compilations. We call them child compilations. So this would be really cool for Electron apps, too, which also have a main and a renderer, right? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So what exactly is this multi-compiler mode? Um, when you're using the multi-compiler mode, um, Webpack builds each config concurrently in the same process while reusing the file system cache. And I want to highlight concurrently and in, in the same process because it's not in parallel. Yes. Webpack uses a single-threaded architecture behind the scenes, and this is why um, you will still see like, uh, significant longer build times uh, when you're building multiple projects. So it does not execute each build in parallel, but it will reuse some of the, the things, like, for instance, the file system cache. But there's got to be a solution for this, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Do you know Trivago? Trivago. Who here knows who Trivago is? Well, that's awesome. We're in Europe. Trivago <laughs> is Webpack's number one sponsor. So just for a moment, can we please just give them a round of applause for making <laughs> Webpack possible? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. But thanks to the work that they've done, they've created Parallel Webpack. And why don't you describe what Parallel Webpack is? So Parallel Web Webpack spins up uh, several processes to build each configuration in different processes. So it's, uh, it's, real, it's in parallel. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so if I, if I wanted to even have, like, let's say, a bunch of smaller applications that I wanted to build, I could have uh, multi, you know, many items in an array of configs and build them in parallel instead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Async Webpack configs. Async Webpack configs. Who's here to Next.js? <laughs> Maybe a few. Okay. 
or Nuxt. So this feature is actually thanks to these uh, library frameworks that abstract on top of React and Vue. So an async webpack config uh, is where you're actually able to pass an async function as the function that returns the config object. And this is super powerful, especially for times when you are waiting on some sort of async process, let's say a database connection or like an API call. Um, but for example, what would show up? Uh, Oh, well. <laughs> Whoa. Now listen up. It's time for a quiz. Is this valid in your configuration? Would this throw an error or would this uh, actually work? So just say it out loud. Who thinks it would work? Chase, five people? <laughs> Who thinks it's invalid? Majority of people. Okay. It's valid. It's valid. You can do this. Oh, yeah. The six people. All right. I'll get, you get your Red you, Bull later. Okay. You get free beer in the evening for that. Yeah, free beer at somebody's party. There you go. <laughs> but we'll have, there's still another time to redeem yourself here. So is this the following actually valid? Raise your hand for yes. Is the following valid? Raise your hand for no. Okay, well, I think the answer is no from people. <gasps> you got it right. Good job. The answer is no. You cannot actually return this. You want to talk about why? Um, yeah, it makes actually no sense because the output path needs. Uh, so we are uh, we are um, um, writing a lot of files, and a single stream doesn't make sense. So, yeah. Exactly. So the next tip is. Um, when uh, maybe you know that situation, you're uh, you're working on your Webpack configuration and you're changing like the configuration, you're changing the loaders, you're installing new modules, and then you you, you don't see anything happen and you ask yourself what's wrong, and then you uh, remind yourself, ah, right, I have to restart the Webpack process. I hate that. Yes. <laughs> I hate that. Unfortunately, like it's not really easy because Webpack can't really like reload itself um, because the, web, the Webpack watch mode is designed for watching the source files, not the actual configuration files. Um, but you can do that with another module. It's really popular. It's called NodeMon, and um, it restarts the process once um, some specific files have changed. So you use nodemon uh, dash dash exec, and you um, give the command that should be executed. And you also should add a watch configuration, and you only should watch the <laughs> just the webpack config. Just the webpack config, because you only want to restart that. You can also watch the package JSON uh, if you want to restart uh, when you install a new module. That's but yeah, this is or important. lock file. Or lock files. Right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, the lock file is even better. Right? More yeah. deterministic. Yeah. <laughs> so this is um, one tip. Use Nodemon. Use Nodemon. Give it a try. Let us know what you think. All right, number seven, use require.resolve. So what is the difference? Does anybody know the difference between require.resolve and um, its path.resolve? No? Uh, why don't we take a look at a configuration? So. Oftentimes, when we are referring to different paths or files in a Webpack config, we're either going to pass an absolute path or a relative path, but Webpack is actually really conservative about throwing errors in these situations. This file may not exist on your file system yet. It may appear later you know, as you're doing development, and Webpack will kick in and make the assumption that you want to alias here. But let's say that you've just made a mistake, right? This is a, you, you know, missed a character or you forgot to write something, and you may see a bug and you pull your hair out not realizing what it was until you came back to your config and saw it. So what we recommend you do is actually use require.resolve. What this does is it validates the existence of this path and makes sure it's valid before actually executing and being used in your Webpack configuration. The next tip is use filter dot filter boolean. And this might seem like a hack if you haven't seen it before. <laughs> and Sean doesn't like it, but I do like it, it so I recommend to, <laughs> to do that. Try it out. <laughs> so the idea is you have a, a specific configuration, and for instance, the style order, and it's really cool to use in development, but it's not really good to use in production. 
So you somehow need to add a flag or, or like a, a, a ternary, ternary statement, a ternary expression. So what you can do is that you do, do this is dev ampersand ampersand and then use dot filter boolean to filter the array. And if you do that, dot filter boolean removes all the falsy values from an array. So this is the con configuration is still very readable, and um, but in the end, only the values that are truthy end up in the array. Or mean. And this also works, of course, with the plugins. And I think it's really useful. But in general, it's also or one caveat you should uh, know is that just because a Webpack configuration takes any code doesn't mean you should put a lot of code in it. That's right. And that leads us to the next part of the question. So uh, tip number nine, avoid logic inside your Webpack configs, um, especially unnecessary logic. And one of the uh, anecdotes that I like to make is you wouldn't treat, I mean, uh, why not hold your configuration and your build infrastructure to the same standard that you hold your everyday code that you write? So unnecessary abstractions or additional logic that doesn't need to be there. Why not use composition and uh, modularization instead? So instead of having logic inside your configuration like this, uh, I like to recommend that you instead compose the configurations using tools like Webpack Merge. <laughs> Webpack Merge is an object assign that's friendly for Webpack configs and allows for a safe merging of things like your rules and uh, rules, loaders in addition to plugins and respects their orders. But the too long didn't read version is instead of having logic in a single config, have a development configuration, a production configuration, and compose them together with a base. This way, you know exactly what you need for the specific environment without having to look at a 1,000 line Webpack code or uh, configuration. So, our next tip is use module rules one off. Who of you has heard of the one off condition? I see one person. Yeah, no, three. Three. <laughs> three. Three, yes. So it's not really popular, but um, I think it would help a lot of Webpack configurations to avoid um, a specific mistake I see very often. Absolutely. So what does the one-off option do? And bef in order to, to explain that, um, you need to know how, how uh, loaders are executed. So three important things to remember about loaders. The order of rules is important of course, and loaders are executed from bottom to top and from right to left. This is sometimes people think it's unintuitive. Leaky abstraction. <laughs> Leaky abstraction. <laughs> and this is really important. Every rule that matches gets applied. So I would say time for a little quiz again. Don't be frightened. It's an easy quiz. <laughs> So given this rules config, what loaders would be executed on a JS module in which order? B, A, A, B, C, C, B, A, or none? Who says one? One. OK. No Two. one. Two. Two? How no about one. three? Oh. So they were listening. Nice. They listened <laughs> to our talk. Three? Who okay. says none? None. None. Okay. Good. <laughs> Congratulations. You are correct. Yes. Number three. So explain why. Yeah. Uh, as I already said, Bottom every, to top. every module that right to uh, every rule that matches gets applied, and I yep. see this error very, very often yep. because people think, oh, the first rule matched, and then uh, it ignores the rest. Yeah. Right. So. That's the correct answer. Uh, so what you can do is you can use the one-off condition. And uh, now the answer would be just the B loader and then the A loader, because it bails out after the first rule that matched. Number 11. So when you're actually using loaders and rules, there's a specific pattern that we think is super successful. So when you're, use, when you're testing uh, to match files, you want to use extensions. Uh, and then you want to use include for absolute paths. So show the example here. When you're actually trying to uh, match against your source code, 
what we do, and I mean, Johannes and myself both uh, do this, we try to do it at Microsoft all the time, is that when you have a project, we try to automatically assume that the only sources that you're going to be filtering through uh, or transpiling with loaders is going to be in your source directory, right? But then, let's say if you want to branch out more, right? Like, let's say there's a special module um, that you know can be transpiled into more optimized code, right? Like, for example, async await compi or transpiles to 82 lines of code for one async await. You wouldn't want to transpile that down since almost every browser supports that today. So what we could do is we could go in and not only can we test against specific files, but we can also include and add them to specific directories or modules that we're looking for. <clears throat> so the pro tip is to always use include instead of exclude. Yes. And this is there the, the example Thank Sean you. mentioned. So let's get to the last tip. And there are actually two parts. There is. Yeah. So I call it with a snappy title, how to apply different loaders on the same module. Part one. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't found a <laughs> find a get better <laughs> title. It's not really catchy, but um, it's OK. It's a really, really cool Webpack feature, and I think almost no one knows. So uh, listen up. <laughs> <laughs> Take notes. So suppose you want to use the React SVG loader. If you don't know that loader, it turns an SVG like this into a React component, a functional React component. And then you can import that component in from another component and just render it. It's really cool. But there's a problem. What's that? Suppose you also want to use that SVG in a CSS file. And now Webpack doesn't know, should it be a React component or should it be a file? Maybe you actually also run into this problem. That would probably throw an error if we just had that one loader, right? Yeah, yeah. It would. So it, this would throw an error because um, you can't import a, a React component into a CSS file. So one possible solution is that you could add a query um, parameter to the, to the URL. What? Yes. It looks odd, but query. actually this, would, this is a valid ECMAScript module because all ECMAScript modules use URLs, so you right. are allowed to put a, a, a query par parameter. So, and if you can configure your Webpack like this, you use the one-off rule, so we bail out when the first rule matches, and then you specify the resource query which says, if this resource query is present, please use the React SVG loader. If not, use the second rule. Whoa, OK. So you, you, if you want to import it as a component, you put the question mark. And if you just want to import it, don't use the question mark. Those but there's even, I, I want to show you that configuration because I think it's really useful. But wow. there's even a better solution to it. And yeah, I was going to say that, que that resource query makes me feel sick. Yeah, it, okay. it looks ugly, I have to admit. It makes me feel sick. Can we do something different? So part two. There is a feature that is called issuer. So when we refer to issuer, we're talking about the file in which the module was imported from. So in this specific case, we can actually filter your, uh, what loaders apply to what based on your issuer. So in this case, we can say, anytime somebody imports an SVG into a JSX file, apply the React SVG loader. Anytime that you are importing an SGV or a SVG file is being treated as a dependency or imported into a CSS file, use the issuer CSS and use the file loader. So this, I mean, in my opinion, it's way cleaner. Uh, the word issuer is kind of different, but I think um, once you understand that it's what's issuing the request for the module, I think that's how I remember it. But yeah, yeah so now you can have both usages, uh, no resource queries, <laughs> and you have this kind of flexibility, which is excellent. Uh, the, the funny thing is that you can also, you could also uh, import a JSON file into a SAS file with that, uh, with that approach. You just need to um, turn that JSON file into valid SAS code, but it would technically, it would work. So you can, uh, you can create r rules to import one module into another and um, use different rules based on the file extension. Yes, yeah, the new design system, JSON and SCSS. 
So to do a short <laughs> No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> to do a short recap, uh, forget what Sean just said. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you don't need a Webpack config. <laughs> we have a good, good default. Uh, there's TypeScript support for the, for the configuration. You can use um, functions as a configuration to pass in env um, parameters. There's multi-compiler mode. You can do async Webpack configs if you re really want to go crazy. <laughs> Go crazy. <laughs> you can use uh, Notemon to restart Webpack. Uh, use require resolve for early errors. Use filter boolean. Avoid config logic. Please. Use, <laughs> use module rules one off. Use test for file extensions. Thank you, yes. Include for absolute paths. And always use include to make yeah, sure. Yeah, always use include. <laughs> to make sure that you don't execute loaders on, uh, on node modules. Yes. And if you want to apply different loaders on the same module, you can use the resource query condition and use the issuer condition. Oh. But <laughs> yeah, since we have time, there's one more Really exciting tip that only you guys are going to find out for the first time. And that is, everything that we just talked about today is in our documentation. <laughs> but we know that you don't read the documentation, so right. it was a secret for you. So <laughs> It is a secret for you. And so if you ever feel nervous or overwhelmed with these tips and you want to learn more or reference them, webpack.js.org, and you can find it in our documentation. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for questions already? No, I, I just want to mention, if you want to look at, at, up any of these tips, you can go to this repository, and you see example configurations. And yeah, thank you. And thank you very much. <laughs> that was. Sean Larkin and Johannes Ewald, we do have a few questions, guys, for you. Whoa. What are the biggest challenges going forward for Webpack Biggest today? challenges? Uh, I think, um, why don't you give, you, you give one sentence and I'll give one sentence of okay. like, what I think my challenge, yeah. I think the biggest challenge is that um, the, like the official specifications currently um, change. So there's a specification, an official specification to import HTML modules into JavaScript and also CSS modules. Um, and this is currently like there's a lot of changing and uh, we want to get this right. But soon, somewhere in the future, we will support native HTML and CSS uh, modules. Exactly, right. One of Webpack's goals is that you could maybe not use a bundler during your development environment, and the code that you wrote still works, right? That's not only just a good development practice, but it's, it could offer other benefits that people want to see, right? And so for that to happen, we have to adhere to the specs that exist today for modules. And so with all this kind of churn that is happening now, uh, it, it does become a challenge for us because then we have to be really careful with the experiments that we ship. Um, I think for, we can just go to the next question. That was good. I like that. All right. So why does Webpack not call the filter Boolean by default? It would be, uh, I mean, you can talk about it. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Since I think it's a good idea, not Sean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, uh, Webpack will actually complain about if you have a falsy value in the, in the array. So it, it validates the configuration. And if it just removes it, I think it's kind of magic um, that you don't always expect. Yep. Uh, suppose you have, you have done a mistake, and then it just removes the config without saying something. I don't think this would be a good idea, so right. uh, yeah. I mean, maybe that's a feature that you could propose by turning on a flag. Why not? Like, that's a good idea. <laughs> the next question is for yeah. you. Yeah, next question is final mind kind of question. <laughs> How, can How can I have a hair as beautiful as Sean? Just grow it out. <laughs> grow it out. Just grow it out and, you know, brush it once a day, and it'll be good. <laughs> what about... <laughs> Tree shaking imported NPM packages. As long as you're using ECMAScript modules, Webpack's default in production mode is to tree shake. So um, as long as you're only using a piece of that module, 
it's, it's only going to, like automatically by default without you having to do anything special, uh, it will automatically tree shake that, what it, that which is not used. Uh, you should mention that the problem is that library authors on NPM need to do something specific. Oh, true. They ne need to add a special flag in the package JSON, a side effect, false flag, mm -hmm. because the problem is if uh, the author doesn't opt in, in like I if the author doesn't tell us that it's side effect free, we can't tree shake uh, because we would remove aggressively. We would remove code and correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to see a great example of a library that does this today correctly, take a look at uh, low dash ES is a, is a great option. Mm. All right, when would you consider Webpack the wrong tool for the job? Uh, when do you consider the wrong tool for the job? Yeah. I mean, so one of our goals of Webpack is that we wanted it to be as much as you want from it, right? So I think that it's meant to be able to scale to huge teams, but we also have a goal to try and make it as easy to use as possible for getting started with even a small project. So it's like, I mean, at the end of the day, Webpack's popular because it is so flexible and configurable, um, but it's also complained about because it's so flexible and configurable. So I think it's really up to you uh, and, or your team or your company when, you know, to decide when it's, you know, you're using it for the wrong job. I think I, there's very specific, yeah, go ahead. I also want to add that uh, Webpack is not a generic task runner. Right. So if you have the requirement, if you want to kick off a specific task when a file changes, sometimes it's still better to use Gulp or Grunt because right. that's the right tool for the job. Yeah, if you're just running tasks, use NPM tasks. Or if you're just transpiling CSS, that's a good example where it'd be, you know, for, for the wrong job. All right, guys, last two questions. Okay. Webpack versus Rollup. What are the benefits of using Webpack instead of Rollup? Um, Webpack is more rigid in terms of being aligned to the specification. Uh, that, like, that's, that's one benefit, right? So, like, if there, like, any, any type of code that the module spec supports, Webpack supports. It, at the cost of, I don't know, roll up, cut some corners, and it's like 2% smaller, right? Uh, I would say the main benefit of Webpack is the ecosystem. And, you know, you, you should almost always use it when you're writing a web application. Uh, but there's huge amounts of benefit for using Rollup to bundle libraries. Webpack itself, we don't recommend you create or package a library using Webpack, but only uh, you, you bundle your application that consumes a library. But this will get better with Webpack 5. It will get way better with Webpack 5, though. <laughs> so stay, stay tuned. Or just right. go out and try the beta. Last question. Will it be possible in the future to use more types of entry points? I'm sorry? Will it be possible in the future to use, use more types of entry points? Like yeah, oh, oh, like built in, yes. I think this, yeah. this, issue, this issue is as old as Webpack. Uh, Seriously. It's, it's one of the like, oldest issues. The problem is that it's technically it's, uh, really challenging. and Because uh, we have to make a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Right? Like, Webpack is not only just an app, a bundler for the web, it's also for Node. It's for Electron apps. It's for, so like, how can we support those features there? Yeah. We have to be just really careful about the defaults. Otherwise, you end up with a, a very generic tool that has a lot more overhead and debt involved in it, where features might not always work the way that you expect them to. But if you're interested in, we are planning to add native support for HTML and CSS. And I expect that we will probably do that once we have that. But uh, yeah. Webpack 5, just add a new module type experimental called asset. So instead of having to use things like file loader, you're going to actually be able to just turn on an experiment that will automatically support assets as a, as a module type. So we're, we're going to go in that same direction for HTML and CSS. Great. There are many other questions, but we don't Come have time for it right now. I mean, this is what you get when you mix a couple of Meister and uh. a paramedic together, you get a wet bag. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, it could be fun. Thank you for laughing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can talk to them once again at the chat zone at 5.30 at the Discovery, uh, Discovery stage today. So with that in mind, thank you so much. Again, this is Sean Larkin and Johannes Ewald. Thank you. Wet back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ciao. Goodbye.